Chapter 4 Balance Taking care without worrying Excess Potential Everything in nature strives towards balance. Changes in air temperature are balanced by wind. Differences in temperature are compensated by thermal exchange. Wherever there is excess potential of any energy form, balanced forces emerge to correct the imbalance. We are so accustomed to such statements on the nature of things that we fail to ask ourselves why it must necessarily be so or how exactly the law of balance works. Laws do not actually explain anything. They are just statements of fact. All laws of nature are secondary and derived from the law of balance. The law of balance is primary, at least it appears to be, and it is impossible to explain why equilibrium should exist in nature in the first place, or, more specifically, where balanced forces originate from and why, indeed, they exist at all. The fact that we have become accustomed to something doesn't mean it is the way things necessarily are. One can only imagine what the world would be like were it not for the law of balance. An atmospheric jelly, or an aggressive furnace, perhaps. However, the unsightliness of such a world is hardly a reason to support the existence of the law of balance. So we are left to accept it as fact and to wonder in admiration at the perfection of the world, nonetheless puzzling over the question of what governs it all. We are used to the fact that there are good and bad spells in life and that success is followed by defeat, for this is all manifestation of the law of balance. Success, like misfortune, destroys the balance. Complete balance is when nothing happens. Absolute balance doesn't exist, or at least no one has yet managed to observe it. Oscillation is observed everywhere in the world, night and day, incoming and outgoing tides, birth and death, etc. Even in a vacuum, Elementary particles are involved in a process of continual birth and dematerialization. The entire world can be seen in the form of pendulums that oscillate, fade, and interact with one another. Every pendulum receives a jolt from its neighbors and, in turn, gives out its own. One of the main laws governing this complex system is the law of balance. Ultimately, everything strives towards balance. You are also a kind of pendulum. If you take it into your head to destroy the balance and sway sharply in a particular direction, you will brush against the neighboring pendulums, creating commotion all around, which will then turn against you. Balance can be destroyed by actions and also by thoughts, and not only because thought is followed by action. As you know, thoughts radiate energy. In the world of material realization, everything has an energetic foundation. Everything that occurs on an invisible level is reflected in the world of visible material objects. It might seem as if the energy of our thoughts is not powerful enough to have an impact on the world around us, and, if that were the case, everything would be a lot simpler. However, let's not make guesses about what's happening on an energetic level. Otherwise, we could get entangled in a knot of conjecture. For our purposes, it is enough to accept the simplified model of balance. Where excess potential appears, balance forces emerge to eliminate it. Excess potential is created by mental energy when too much importance is given to a particular object. For example, let's compare two situations. In one situation, you are standing on the floor in your house, and in the other, you are standing on the edge of a precipice. In the first case, 
the situation causes you no concern. In the second case, the situation is of grave significance. One careless movement and the mistake is irreparable. On an energetic level, however, the fact of simply standing is of equal significance in both cases. Standing above a precipice, your fear heightens intensity and creates inhomogeneity in the energy field. At this point, balanced forces emerge aimed at neutralizing the excess potential. You can even feel their influence. On the one hand, an inexplicable force seems to pull you downwards, and, on the other, another force draws you to step away from the edge. To eliminate the excess potential of your fear, the balanced forces are required either to drag you away from the edge, or to cast you downwards and be done with it. It is the impact of the balanced forces that you are experiencing. On an energetic level, all material objects are of equal significance. It is we that attribute specific qualities to them such as good, bad, cheerful, sad, attractive, repulsive, kind, wicked, simple, complex, etc. Everything in this world is subject to our assessment. The assessment itself does not create inhomogeneity in the energy field. Sitting in an armchair at home, you can make the assessment that sitting there is safe, but standing at the edge of a precipice is dangerous. At the moment of making the assessment, the situation you are considering does not worry you, and so balance is in no way disturbed. Excess potential only appears in cases where the level of importance attributed to the assessment is excessive. The amount of potential is increased if the assessment which is attributed huge value also greatly distorts reality. Generally speaking, if an object is very important to us, we are incapable of objectively assessing its quality. For example, an object of worship is always attributed excess worth, and an object of hate, excess detriment, an object of fear, terrifying qualities. Thought energy strives to artificially produce a certain quality there, where, in fact, it is not present. As a result, excess potential is created which summons the wind of balanced forces. The bias of the assessment which is a distortion of reality, is twofold. The object in question is excessively attributed either negative or positive qualities. However, of itself, an error of assessment plays no role in the matter. Note that the bias in assessment generates excess potential only if it is attributed great meaning. It is only the importance that the assessment has for you personally that enables your energy to be transmitted to it. Excess potential is invisible and intangible, and yet it plays a significant and even insidious role in people's lives. When balanced forces eliminate excess potential, they can generate myriad problems. Paradoxically, the end result is often the exact opposite of the original intention and people do not understand why this happens. It is this phenomenon that sometimes makes us feel as if some inexplicable dark force has a grip on our lives, like Sod's Law. We touched on this when we were discussing why people get what they do not want rather than what they do want. Here is another example of how what we desire slips away from us. Some people believe that if you devote yourself fully to your work, you will achieve excellent results. If you look at this position from the point of view of scales and balance, it is obvious that immersing yourself so heavily in work is like placing your work on one dish of the scales and absolutely everything else in the other dish. Naturally, balance is destroyed and the consequences become visible all too soon. The result of prioritizing work to this extent 
will be the exact opposite of what you expected. If working harder means earning more money or improving your qualifications, then, of course, a little extra effort will do no harm. Like everything in life, there should be good measure and proportionality. If, however, you are constantly exhausted and have become your own slave driver, then it would be better to slow down a little or even look for a different type of job. Either way, the point is that any effort made beyond measure will inevitably lead to negative consequences. This is what happens on an energetic level. Aside from work, everyone has their own set of values, be it home, family, leisure pursuits, etc. If you juxtapose all your other values with the one value of work, you create strong potential. Everything in nature strives towards equilibrium, which means that, aside from your own will, other forces would come into play to mitigate the consequences of the excess potential you are creating. Balanced forces can work in all sorts of different ways. You may become ill, in which case there could be no question of working any harder. You may start suffering from depression, which would not be altogether surprising because you would have been so hard on yourself. The voice of the rational mind shouts, come on, you must earn more money. While the soul or subconscious objects, surely this is not what I came into the world for, to suffer and torture myself. Why bring this on myself? Eventually, you would become chronically tired and any plans to be more productive would have to be forgotten. You would probably end up feeling that you were banging your head against a brick wall, getting nowhere fast. When people do overly prioritize their work, there always seems to be someone else around who achieves more whilst making considerably less effort. Once a person achieves a certain level in their job, there can be a tendency to place massive importance on their work. But, unfortunately, the more disproportionately important it becomes, the more likely it is that problems will arise. People assume it is quite natural for there to be problems, but, in reality, the number of problems a person experiences is reduced significantly when they lower their expectations and relax their attachment. The only conclusion that can be drawn from this is that you have to consciously reevaluate your relationship to your work if you want to avoid creating excess potential. It is essential to have free time in which you can do the things you enjoy. People who do not know how to switch off and relax do not know how to work well either. When you arrive at work, detach yourself. Give your head and hands, but do not give away your heart. The work pendulum wants all the energy you can give it, but you did not come into the world simply to work for a pendulum. Your efficiency at work will be noticeably increased when you stop creating excess potential and free yourself from destructive pendulums. Match attachment with integrity. Be careful not to make small errors or faux pas, which would enable others to accuse you of being irresponsible or negligent. It is important to carry out your responsibilities with integrity. Detaching yourself from a situation does not mean behaving carelessly in a slack or slipshod manner. It means to act with a cold mind without creating excess potential at the same time as fulfilling the tasks required of you. This approach protects you from being drawn into unpleasant situations. There will always be people you know or colleagues who continue to immerse themselves headfirst in their work. On a subconscious level, they will sense that, although you act with impeccability, you are sufficiently emotionally detached not to put yourself on the line completely. 
These conscientious individuals will instinctively feel the urge trip their competitor up on some oversight. As soon as you make a mistake, they will be there to criticize you. The sad thing is that the mistake is likely to be something quite mundane and harmless. You might be just a little late for work or have forgotten something fairly minor. If you had sunk your head in the work sand, as they do, no one would make anything of it. However, once you change your attitude to your work, little things give people the opportunity to accuse you of slacking or lacking in dedication. Situations like these can also arise at home and among your friends, so it is important in any situation where you are detaching yourself to fulfill your responsibilities attentively, thereby not giving anyone the opportunity to reproach you. It is the inner witness, the guardian, that enables you to act with integrity at the same time as holding back from throwing yourself headfirst into the race. The notion of the inner guardian has nothing to do with a split personality. It is the part of yourself that stands in the background and observes what you are doing and how you are doing it. We will return to this theme in forthcoming chapters. Some might say that throwing yourself completely into your work is, on the contrary, a wonderful thing. Of course, it depends on what your work is. Total immersion in your work is only justified from the point of view of balance if it is connected to your personal goal. The personal goal is also a theme we will look at more closely a little later. If you love your work because it coincides with your personal goal, then it can serve as the tunnel that leads to success. This kind of work nourishes your energy, bringing joy, inspiration, and fulfillment. If you are one of the lucky ones who can confidently say that they feel this way about their work, then you have nothing to worry about. Exactly the same goes for study. Later in this chapter, we will look at other situations in life where excess potential is created and the impact of balanced forces. Resentment and Judgment We will begin with the resentment of self. This feeling arises when a person is unfulfilled by their personal achievements and qualities and finds it hard to accept their own weaknesses. It is quite possible to be conscious of your own shortcomings without inflating them into a complex. If you are intensely focused on your own foibles, excess potential will be created. Balanced forces immediately get to work to eliminate the potential. Their action can be focused either on developing certain new qualities or on battling with the original weakness. People have a tendency to work with one or the other, depending on their nature. Most often, a person chooses to battle with the less attractive parts of themselves, and their position turns against them. There is no point in trying to hide weaknesses, and overcoming them can be tricky. Trying to hide them only creates the opposite effect, which makes the situation even worse. For example, when a shy person makes an effort to hide their shyness, they can come across as very held back or, on the contrary, excessively cheeky. If a person is dissatisfied with their achievements to the degree that it serves as motivation for self-improvement, then balance is not disturbed. The outside world is not affected and the inner shift towards balance is established via positive action. If a person starts upsetting themselves, beating themselves up, or even worse, punishing themselves, then a destructive dialogue between heart and mind is created. The heart is self-sufficient, perfect, and does not deserve to be treated so harshly. All shortcomings that a person acquires are shortcomings of the mind, not the soul. You could write a whole book on just the connection between the heart and mind. Suffice to say that conflict between the heart and the mind is greatly undermining. 
If reason dominates and the soul closes in on itself, life can become chaotic. To avoid having to turn to a psychotherapist further down the road, let yourself go and forgive yourself for your perceived imperfections. Even if you have not yet learned to love yourself, you can at least refrain from fueling the inner battle of self-criticism and accept yourself the way you are. Only then can the heart be the mind's ally. And what a powerful ally it is. Okay, you say. If I let go and leave all my imperfections in peace, how then will I acquire the better qualities I wish to have? I do not want to stop developing. This is not about having to give up the striving to embody whatever qualities you admire. It is about giving up the war with self over your perceived imperfections. When you wage war on yourself with constant criticism, you waste energy by supporting something which is not so much futile as harmful because of the excess potential it creates. When you finally stop battling, energy is freed up that can be channeled into self-development. Although this may sound all incredibly simple, many people do in fact use up a colossal amount of energy battling against themselves, trying to hide their shortcomings. They are like titans committing themselves to a lifetime of carrying a heavy load. All they have to do is lay down the heavy burden, be themselves, and then life would become noticeably easier and simpler. Energy could then be transferred from battling with imperfection to developing more worthy qualities and the quality of this new energy would correspond to lifelines where positive characteristics outweigh weaknesses. Think about it. How can you shift to a lifeline where your body is in good shape if all your thoughts center around your physical shortcomings? You end up getting what you decisively do not want. When you are dissatisfied with yourself, you enter into conflict with your soul. When you are dissatisfied with the world around you, you end up entering into conflict with a large number of pendulums. As you know, there is absolutely nothing to be gained from succumbing to their influence, and waging war on them does not even bear thinking about. Dissatisfaction represents an energetic vibration whose frequency matches lifelines where the thing you are dissatisfied with is even more clearly present. Being pulled by these lifelines makes you become even more dissatisfied and the vicious circle continues until you reach a lifeline where you are old and ill, incapable of changing anything for the better, with comfort only to be found in grumbling at the world together with others who are the same and sharing memories of how much better things used to be in the good old days. Every generation is certain that life is worse today than it used to be. But the truth of the matter is that life has only become worse for one generation or, more specifically, for those among that generation who wallow in their own discontentment. If life were gradually getting worse with every generation, there would come a point at which humanity would be doomed to living hell. A sorry image, is it not? Wallowing is one aspect of discontentment that makes life appear as if it is gradually getting worse. The other side to the harmful habit of expressing intolerance is that it disturbs the balance. Lack of acceptance creates excess potential in a person's energy space irrespective of whether that response is justified or not. Excess potential generates balanced forces that strive to restore equilibrium. It would be wonderful if the impact of these forces changed every situation for the better. Unfortunately, it is often the other way around. Balanced forces besiege you so that your complaints about life will have as little weight as possible. This is much simpler than changing all the things about life that you are dissatisfied with. Imagine what would happen 
if a leader fervently expressed their displeasure at everything taking place in their country. It would not matter whether the leader's intentions were good or bad. History is filled with examples of political leaders who have behaved in such a way and have either been removed from government or physically annihilated as a result. Generally speaking, when a person creates excess potential, the impact of balanced forces is aimed at reducing their influence on the world. This can easily be achieved in many ways, such as via social status, work, income, home, family, health, etc. Now, you can see why the older generation lives the life it does. If you take pleasure in life, it might seem logical, after what has been said above, that balanced forces would be motivated to ruin everything or push you away, but this is not how things work. Unless, of course, joyfulness has been reduced to foolish rapture or wide-eyed enthusiasm. Firstly, a happy person transmits creative energy which shifts them onto positive lifelines. And, secondly, creative energy does not create the destructive potential that balanced forces strive to eliminate. It is no coincidence that different philosophies and religions have pronounced love in the universal meaning of the word to be the force that created the world. Balanced forces are a product of that same creative force. They simply strive to maintain order and are not capable of turning against the very energy that created them. From the point of view of trend surfing, the habit of expressing displeasure at little things is harmful and undermining, whereas the habit of taking pleasure in tiny details is empowering. For this reason, the technique is aimed at substituting the former habit with the latter. The technique is very simple. However banal it sounds, every cloud has a silver lining. If you set yourself the task of looking for the positive in every negative situation you encounter, you will find that it is not actually that difficult to do. It can even be a kind of game. If you play the game consistently, the old habit will be replaced by a new one, which will be of great benefit to you personally, but a nightmare for destructive pendulums. If something terrible happens, which it would be unnatural to see positively, follow the example of King Solomon. King Solomon wore a ring with the inscription, This too shall pass, on the inside edge of the ring, so that no one else would see it. When the king suffered misfortune, or came up against a complex problem, he would turn the ring over and read the words of the inscription. The habit of expressing disapproval has developed under the influence of destructive pendulums that feed on negative energy. Once looking for the positive in life has become a habit, you will generate positive energy which will build up into a powerful flow carrying you on to positive life lines. If you are inspired by the prospect and consistently practice the technique of substituting one focus with another, from time to time you will notice that it is taking less conscious effort and, as the habit becomes more deeply rooted, you will eventually forget altogether that you once had a habit you wanted to change. As soon as you weaken, a pendulum will find a reason to upset you, and you will observe that, once again, you have given it your energy. Do not be disappointed if this happens. If your intention is strong, you will get there, and eventually, destructive pendulums will leave you alone. All you have to do is keep reminding yourself of your original intention. We are all guests in this world, and no one has the right to judge that which they did not create. This statement should particularly be taken in the light of relationships with pendulums. As has already been said, you only make things worse for yourself if you start fighting a destructive pendulum that is causing you resentment. You do not have to play the obedient sheep 
but neither should you enter into open confrontation with the world around you. If a pendulum conflicts with you personally, you can apply the methods of defeating or stilling it. When the pendulum tries to draw you into a fight with another pendulum, try to remain self-aware and ask yourself whether doing so would be of any personal benefit. Returning to the metaphor of visiting an exhibition with pictures that you do not like, the saying, make yourself at home, but don't forget you are a guest, is very fitting. No one has the right to judge, but everyone has freedom of choice. If you fervently express your discontent, the pendulum benefits, but if you quietly walk away and visit a different exhibit, you will benefit. I hear you ask, but what if there is nowhere else to go? That there is no alternative is a misconception instilled by the pendulum, and this book is dedicated to the task of ridding the listener of this false, limiting belief. Dependent Relationships Idealizing the world is the reverse side of the coin of dissatisfaction. When you idealize the world, things take on a rose-colored tint and much appears better than it really is. As you know, when a person sees something that is not really there, excess potential is created. To idealize something means to overestimate it, to place it on a pedestal, to worship it, or create an idol to it. The love which creates and rules the world is very different to idealization. However paradoxical it may sound, love is, in essence, dispassionate and unemotional. Unconditional love is admiration without worship or the need to possess. In other words, it does not create interdependent relationships between the one doing the loving and the object of their love. This simple truth helps to determine where love ends and idealization begins. Imagine walking through a mountain valley filled with greenery and flowers. You are thrilled by the incredible landscape. You breathe in the fresh air and aromas and your soul is filled with happiness and tranquility. This is love. Then you begin to pick the flowers, gripping them in your hands, forgetting that they are alive, and the flowers slowly start to die. Later, it occurs to you that you could make perfume and cosmetics from the flowers, sell them, or even create a flower faith and worship them like icons. This would also represent a form of idealization because, either way, dependency would be created between yourself and the object of your love, in this case, the flowers. At this stage, there is no trace left of the love that existed in the moment of simply enjoying the vision of the flower-filled valley. Can you see the difference? Love generates positive energy which carries you onto corresponding lifelines. Idealization, on the other hand, creates excess potential generating balanced forces intent on mitigating its impact. The effect of balanced forces is different depending on the situation, but the result is always the same. In general terms, it can be described that balanced forces debunk myths. Depending on the object and the level of idealization involved, the debunking may be stronger or weaker in effect but balance is always restored. When love changes into a dependent relationship, it is inevitable that excess potential will be created because the desire to possess something creates an energetic drop in pressure. Dependent relationships are determined by a statement of conditions such as, if you, this, then I, that, there are endless examples of the conditions people place on relationships. If you loved me, you would drop everything and come with me to the end of the world. If you won't marry me, it means you don't love me. If you praise me, I will go out with you. If you don't give me your spade, 
I'll drive you out of the sand pit, etc. As soon as one thing is compared to another, or juxtaposed with another, balance is destroyed. We often hear that we are like this and they are like that, as an expression of national pride. But in comparison to which nations and where does this feeling of insecurity come from? Whenever contrast is made, be it positive or negative, balanced forces will eliminate the excess potential it creates. The impact of balanced forces will primarily work against the person creating the potential. Their actions are either aimed at pulling the parties involved apart or at uniting them, which in turn leads to a clash or to mutual agreement. All conflicts are based on contrast and contradistinction. An initial statement is made such as, they are different to us. Then, the statement is developed further. They have more than we do. Let's take some of theirs. They have less than we do. We must give them some of ours. They are worse than we are. We must change them. They are better than we are. We must fight them. They do not behave like we do. Something will have to be done about it. All these comparisons in their various guises lead to conflict. They originate with feelings of discomfort within one individual and end in war and revolution. Balanced forces can eliminate contradictions via confrontation and via acceptance. But given the fact that pendulums can feed on aggressive energy more often than not, Pendulums often nudge the situation towards confrontation. Below are several examples of the consequences of various types of idealization. Idealization and Overvaluation Overvaluation is when a person is imagined to have qualities they do not, in fact, embody. On one level, the illusions of the mind are quite harmless. On the energetic level, however, they generate excess potential because potential is created wherever there is a flux in quantity or quality. Overvaluation is a projection and concentration of qualities there where they are not present in reality. There are two types of idealization. In the first type, an individual is portrayed as having qualities which are, in fact, totally uncharacteristic. In order to eliminate the resulting inhomogeneity in the energy field, balanced forces have to create some kind of counterforce. For example, a dreamy and romantic young man creates a mental image of his beloved, portraying her as an angel of pure beauty. In reality, it turns out that the young woman in question is a grounded individual who loves having a good time and shows no interest in sharing the dreams of the love-struck young man. Whatever the circumstances, when a person creates an idol of another and places them on a pedestal, the myth will sooner or later be debunked and the necessary disillusionment follows. In this context, the story of the writer Carl May is quite remarkable. May was the author of some popular adventure novels set in the American Old West and best known for the characters of Winnetto and Old Shatterhand. May's novels were written in the style of first-person narrator, creating the impression that he had personally participated in the events portrayed in his books, thereby earning great admiration. May's works are as vivid and rich as a film and so the reader could well assume that the story was a factual account. May's plots were so exciting that he was dubbed the German Dumas. Numerous Carl May fans identified the writer with the famous cowboy, Old Shatterhand. His admirers could hardly have considered any different. After all, they had found an object of admiration and imitation, and one who lived close by, making his persona even more powerful. Imagine their surprise when it was announced that Carl May had never even visited America, and some of the works had been written during his time in prison. The myth was debunked, the illusion dispelled, 
and the writer's former fans became his execrators. Who was to blame? After all, the readers created the idol themselves and, along with it, a dependent relationship. Yes, you are our hero, but only if the book is a real-life story. In the second type of idealization, a person's attention is focused not on a person with illusory qualities, but on rose-tinted dreams and castles in the air. The dreamer lives with their head in the clouds as a way of escaping the ugliness of the reality of life. Obviously, excess potential is created in this situation. To tear down the castles in the air, balanced forces make the romantic individual face harsh reality. Even if the person in question is capable of distracting hundreds with their idea, thereby creating a separate pendulum, the utopia will be flawed because it is based on the bias of excess potential. Sooner or later, balanced forces will stop the pendulum's sway. Here is another example of how an overvalued object exists as an ideal. A woman is imagining what her ideal husband would look like. The more she convinces herself that her future husband must be of a certain type, the stronger the excess potential that is created. The excess potential can only be neutralized by a person who embodies the qualities which are the exact opposite of what the woman wanted to find in her partner. When she meets someone and later discovers what they are really like, the woman asks herself how she could have been so blind. The opposite can also occur. If a woman focuses on how much she hates drunkenness and rudeness in a man, she may fall into the trap of building a relationship with an alcoholic man or a man who badmouths her. Often, people find they have to deal with the things they find totally unacceptable because, in addition to creating excess potential, their thought energy radiates at the frequency of their non-acceptance. Life often brings people together who are very different and who would appear to be totally incompatible. Balanced forces bring people together who have opposite qualities of potential, in that way striving to neutralize the imbalance created by one or the other. The influence of balanced forces can be seen especially clearly in children, because children tend to be more sensitive to energy than adults and behave more naturally. If a child is praised too much, they will start being deliberately naughty. Children lose respect for, and even end up despising adults that let the child twist them around their little finger. If a parent does all they can to turn their little boy into a well-brought-up goody-two-shoes, the child will probably end up breaking out and getting involved with some kind of street gang. If a parent tries to create a wunderkind out of their child, the likelihood is that they will lose all interest in their studies. The more the parent burdens the child with after-school clubs, activities, and private lessons, the more likely the child is to grow up with a dull personality. The best principle in bringing up children is to behave towards the child, and not only towards children, as if they were guests, i.e., giving them attention, respect, and freedom of choice, without creating excess potential, and without letting them run the show, or make your life a misery. The relationship should be constructed on the analogy that you too are no more than a guest in this world. If you accept the rules of the game without going to extremes, you will be free to choose from all that exists in this world. Healthy relationships are as common as unhealthy relationships, and there is a certain balance in the existence of both. Hate exists, and so does love. A quality of a healthy, balanced relationship is that it does not produce excess potential. Potential emerges when there is a noticeable bias in an assessment with regards to the nominal value. Evaluations are relative on the scale of distortion, zero can be considered unconditional love. As you know, unconditional love 
does not support dependent relationships, nor does it create excess potential. This kind of love, however, is extremely rare. Normally, possession, dependence, and overvaluation are mixed into love's vessel. It is difficult to resist feelings of possessiveness and quite natural that one should want to know that you have the person you love, as long as things do not go to one of two extremes. The first extreme is the desire to possess the object of your love, if that person is only vaguely associated with you and might not even suspect your desires. Of course, you understand that I am not only talking about the physical aspect of possession. This is what happens in the classical case of unrequited love, which always leads to much suffering. However, the mechanism at play here is not quite as simple as you might think. Remember the flower metaphor. You love to wander among the flowers, admiring their beauty, and you may have wondered whether they love you too. Now, try to imagine what the flowers think of you. All sorts of strange ideas will enter your mind, such as fear, anxiety, dislike, indifference. You may wonder what reason the flowers could have to love you. Perhaps you desperately want to hold them in your hand, but you cannot because they are growing in a flower bed or are for sale, but are very expensive. What one experiences at this stage is no longer love, but dependency and, with that, negative emotions begin to creep in. So, you are in one place, and the object of your love is in another, and you would like to have the object of your love with you, i.e., you are creating energetic potential. One might think that excess potential would draw the desired object to you, like air mass that shifts from an area of high to low pressure but that is not how things work at all. It makes no difference to balanced forces what method is used to re-establish equilibrium, and so they may place the object of your love at an either further distance from you, thereby neutralizing the excess potential and breaking your heart at the same time. If, at the slightest sign of disappointment in love, a person is inclined to dramatize the situation even more with thoughts that the person of their dreams does not love them. They will be pulled towards lifelines where reciprocated love is a rare phenomenon. The stronger your desire to have something or to experience reciprocated love, the stronger the action taken by balanced forces will be. Of course, if they choose a path that brings you and your loved one closer together, then the story will have a happy ending. The direction balanced forces will ultimately take can easily be determined at the very outset. If you are preoccupied or obsessed with the need for your feelings to be mutual and yet nothing seems to be going right, you need to change your tactics. Try loving without expectation of reward. If you do this, the unstable vibrations of balanced forces can be drawn closer and made to work for you. Otherwise, the situation may go snowballing out of control until it is practically impossible to change anything. There is only one solution in a situation like this. If you want your love to be mutual, you have to love simply without thought of whether you are loved or not. Firstly, in taking this approach, you avoid creating excess potential, which means that the 50% probability that the forces will work against you is avoided. Secondly, when you are not obsessed with the idea of whether your feelings will be reciprocated, you are free of the dramatic and uncontrolled thoughts about unrequited love that pull you onto corresponding lifelines. Quite the opposite. If you simply love, without thought of possession, dependency is avoided, and the parameters of the energy you radiate will correspond with those lifelines where requited love exists. If you have already discovered requited love, then you have no reason to be concerned with the issue of ownership 
and possession. Imagine how greatly your chances of being close to the one you love will increase for having given up the notion of possessing them. Besides, unconditional love is a very rare and attractive quality, and so, if you can embody it, you will automatically draw people to you. Would you not be drawn towards a person who loved you simply for the sake of it, without demanding anything in return? The second extreme concerns the right to ownership, which is, of course, jealousy. In this case, balanced forces have two potential means of action. If you are already in a relationship with the person you love, then the first means of action is to bring you even closer together. Some people enjoy an element of jealousy in their relationship. The other option is for balanced forces to destroy whatever gave rise to the jealousy, i.e. the love itself. In this case, the stronger the jealousy, the deeper the grave it digs for the love being shared in the relationship. The dynamics of love, which becomes expressed as jealousy, are just the same as the shift from simply savoring the aroma of the wild flowers to wanting to produce perfume. All of the above relates as much to women as it does to men, but this is not the final word on the matter. We will return to this question later when we look at other concepts that underpin transurfing. Everything is so simple and yet, at the same time, so complex. Complex because a person in love loses their ability to rationalize, and so the recommendations above will probably fall to the wayside. I shall not, however, upset myself with these things because I resist the need for the listener's recognition. Contempt and Vanity Judging other people is a very powerful way of destroying balance, particularly when we have contempt for them. On an energetic level, there are no good or bad people. There are simply those who observe the laws of nature and those who unsettle nature's status quo. The latter always eventually succumb to the power of balanced forces which strive to restore balance. Of course, situations often arise in which a person deserves to be judged. The question is whether you should be the one to judge them. This is no superficial question. If someone injures you personally, then they have probably also destroyed the existing balance. In this case, your judgment is less likely to represent a source of unhealthy excess potential than it is a tool for balanced forces striving to restore balance. If you say what you think and take any necessary reasonable measures, the disturber of the peace will get what they deserve. If, however, the person you judge has done nothing specifically to hurt you, then it is not for you to make accusations. Look at it from a purely practical point of view. It would be pointless to feel hatred towards a wolf you saw tearing a sheep to pieces on television. It is our natural sense of justice that impels us to judge others, but what originates as an innate feeling can quickly turn into habit with many, over the years, turning into professional prosecutors. Most of the time, you cannot know what caused a person to act the way they did. And, who knows, if you had been in their shoes, maybe you would have done something even worse. This kind of judgment creates excess potential in your energy field, which is hardly surprising, because we tend to believe that, to the same extent that the accused is bad, we are the epitome of goodness. If the accused has horns and hooves, then you must be an angel, right? Nonetheless, because we have not actually grown a pair of wings yet, the forces that strive to restore balance are called into play. Their action will be different depending on the situation, but the result is essentially the same. You get a slap. Depending on the force and form of the judgment, the slap may range from being hardly noticeable to so hard that you are swiped into one of the worst possible lifelines you can imagine. 
It is easy to imagine the different forms that judgment takes and the consequences of it. However, for clarity, I will cite a few examples. Whatever happens in life, never scorn anyone. It is the most dangerous form of judgment because you find yourself in the shoes of the person you scorned. For balanced forces, this would be the most simple, direct means of restoring the harmony lost as a result of your bias and judgment. If you have contempt for beggars and tramps, you too could, one day, lose all your money and your home as a way of restoring balance. If you have disdain for people with physical disabilities, you could, just as easily, have an accident. If you turn your nose up at alcoholics and drug addicts, you could end up in their shoes, too. People are not born into these roles. The circumstances of life create the role. Why then should you be immune to such circumstances? Never judge your work colleagues, whatever they do. At best, you will find that, at some point, you will make the same mistake they did. At worst, a conflict could arise which ends with you losing your job, even if you were not to blame. If you judge a person for how they are dressed, you could, yourself, end up one rung lower than them on the ladder of good and bad, simply as a result of radiating negative thought energy. There is nothing wrong with a person taking pride in their achievements or loving themselves. A general love for oneself is healthy and harms no one. Balance is only destroyed if an overinflated sense of one's own worth is juxtaposed by a superior attitude to the weaknesses, shortcomings, or humble achievements of others. Then, healthy self-esteem becomes arrogance, pride, and vanity. The action of balanced forces will again result in a slap on the cheek. Contempt and vanity are the vices of man. Animals do not embody these characteristics in their behavior. They are led by the consistent purpose of fulfilling nature's will perfectly. Nature is more perfect than the human mind. The wolf, like all predators, feels no hate or contempt for its prey. Try feeling hate or contempt towards a lamb chop. People, however, build their relationships with each other on masses of excess potential. The majesty of animals and plants lies in the fact that they are unaware of their greatness. Conscious awareness has given man many advantages, but it also brings with it the rubbish of feelings like guilt, inferiority, vanity, and contempt. Superiority and Inferiority Feelings of superiority and inferiority are indicative of dependent relationships. When you compare your own qualities to those of others, you inevitably create excess potential. On an energetic level, it makes no difference whether you express your superiority publicly or just secretly congratulate yourself on being better than others. Quite obviously, open expressions of superiority cause others to dislike you. People who make comparisons are often striving to artificially boost their own ego at the cost of others. This kind of behavior always creates excess potential, even if it is just a shadow of the arrogance that is not expressed openly and balanced forces will come in with a slap. People compare themselves to the world around them as a means of establishing a sense of their own self-worth. However, this type of self-assertion is as illusory as a fly trying to force its way through a pane of glass when the window next to it is wide open. When a person strives to prove their importance to the world, energy is wasted on supporting excess potential. Working on self-development, on the other hand, creates real virtues. No energy is wasted, and no harmful excess potential is created. You might think that the amount of energy spent on making a comparison is minimal. In actual fact, 
the energy involved is more than enough to support a relatively powerful charge of excess potential. What determines the charge is how you direct your energy. If your goal is to develop certain qualities in yourself, then this intention will propel you forwards. If, however, your goal is to demonstrate all your regalia to the rest of the world, your wheels will spin helplessly as if caught in a deep rut, going nowhere but creating an irregularity in the energy field. The world will be stunned by the shining regalia and balanced forces will take effect. The forces do not have a lot of choice. They can either freshen up the colors of the external world which has been paled by comparison or reduce the shine of the misplaced star. The first option is, of course, far too labor-intensive, so it only leaves the second. Balanced forces have numerous ways of doing this. They do not have to deprive the ambitious star of its regalia. They can simply send them an unpleasant situation to bring them down a peg or two. We often perceive problems, obstacles, and misfortune to be integral parts of the world we live in. No one is at all surprised that difficulties, small and large, accompany them throughout their lives. We have all adopted the view that this is the way of the world. In actual fact, misfortune is an anomaly and not a normal phenomenon. Often, it is not possible to find a logical explanation for why a problem occurred and why it happened to you in particular. The majority of unpleasant moments we experience are generated by the actions of balanced forces as part of their function in eliminating excess potential created either by you or those in your immediate environment. Most people are unaware of the fact that they have created excess potential and that balanced forces exist and so interpret the problems they face to be the manifestation of some unavoidable dark force. You can eliminate the majority of the problems you usually face if you relieve yourself of the colossal effort of supporting excess potential. A huge amount of energy is wasted on excess potential that often produces a result which represents the complete opposite of your original intention. To free yourself from the action of balanced forces, you have to stop buzzing like a fly against a pane of glass. Switch your intention from increasing your own sense of self-importance to developing the qualities you admire. You also have to let go of any lurking idea that you are capable of controlling the external world. Irrespective of your place on the social ladder, if you believe you can manipulate the world around you, things will definitely go wrong because attempts to change the world destroy the balance. Interference with the workings of the world has a negative affect on the interests of the majority. Transurfing enables you to choose your destiny without compromising anyone else's interests. This is, ultimately, much more effective than storming ahead and overcoming all the obstacles in your way. Your fate is truly in your hands, but only in the sense that it has been given to you to choose it rather than change it. Many people have suffered failure because they have taken the idea of creating your own destiny literally. There is no place for battle in transurfing, so you can lay down the weapons of war with relief. Refusing to behave with superiority has nothing to do with self-deprecation. Belittling your own worth is just the other side of the coin. On an energetic level, it is irrelevant which extreme of the complex you embody. The size of the potential created is in direct proportion to the extent with which a person's evaluation of the world differs from reality. When balanced forces encounter self-importance, they knock it off its pedestal. 
In the case of an inferiority complex, they force a person to raise their falsely reduced sense of worth. Balanced forces act directly and without concern for the subtleties of human relationships. And so, often, once they start having an impact, a person begins to act less naturally, highlighting the aspects of themselves they would prefer to hide all the more. For example, teenagers can be defiant as a way of compensating for their feelings of insecurity. Shy people can act in an overly overt fashion in order to hide their shyness. People with low self-esteem want to put their best side forward and so often behave in a manner which is affected and tense, etc. Whatever your psychological makeup, trying to battle against a complex can be more complicated and lead to more unpleasant consequences than the complex itself. As you know, trying to hide a complex or battling against an inferiority complex is futile. The only way of mitigating its consequences is to eliminate the complex altogether, which is no easy task. There is no point in repeatedly telling yourself that everything is wonderful because you cannot fool yourself. The slide technique can be helpful though, and we will come to that later. At this stage, it is enough to establish the fact that a preoccupation with your own shortcomings in comparison to the qualities of others has the same effect as desiring to illustrate your comparative eminence. The result will be the opposite of what you originally intended. Do not think that others around you attribute to your shortcomings the same meaning that you do. Everyone is mostly concerned with themselves, and so you can freely relieve yourself of a huge burden. Excess potential will dissipate, balanced forces will cease from accentuating the situation, and the freed energy can be used for self-development. Rather than fighting your flaws or trying to hide them, they can be compensated for with other qualities. Charm can compensate for a lack of physical beauty. There are people who are relatively unattractive in their external appearance, but who enthrall others with their words. Self-confidence also compensates for physical flaws, and many great historical figures were no picture to look at. The inability to communicate freely can be compensated for by being a good listener. As the saying goes, they're all lying, but it doesn't matter because no one is listening. Your eloquence may interest people, but only to a lesser degree. Everyone, just like you, is focused on themselves and their problems. And so, a good listener, who will let you pour your heart out to them, is a real treasure. To those who are genuinely shy, take my advice. Guard this quality like a precious jewel. Believe me, there is a hidden charm to shyness. When you let go of fighting your shyness, it will stop coming across as clumsiness, and you will notice how people begin to find you more attractive. Here is another example of how one quality compensates for another. The conditioned need to be cool often causes people to imitate those individuals who have already achieved the status of being cool. To mindlessly copy someone else's script creates nothing more than a parody. Everyone has their own script. All you need to do is choose your own credo and live by it. To imitate others in an attempt to gain the status of being cool is like using the method of the fly beating itself up against the window pane. For example, in a group of teenagers, the leader will be the one who lives according to their own beliefs. The leader is, therefore, free not to take advice from others on how they should act. The leader does not need to imitate anyone. They simply have a worthy opinion of themselves. They know what they are doing. They do not need to suck up to anyone or prove anything to anybody. 
the leader is, therefore, free of excess potential and receives the deserved advantage. In any group, the leader is always the person who lives according to their own beliefs. When a person has freed themselves from the burden of excess potential, they have nothing to prove. They have an inner freedom, they are self-sufficient, and have more energy than those around them. These qualities give them the advantage of becoming leader. Can you see where the open window is? Maybe you think that these types of dynamic do not concern you and that you don't suffer from issues like these. Do not deceive yourself. Everyone, to some degree or another, has a tendency to create excess potential in the energy fields around them. But, if you follow the principles of transurfing, complexes of inferiority or superiority will simply vanish from your life. Love to have, love to hate. I want, never gets. There is truth in this childhood admonition, although here I would rephrase it slightly to, the stronger you want something, the less likely you are to get it. When you want something so much that you are willing to place everything on the cards to get it, you create huge excess potential which destroys balance. Balanced forces can then throw you onto a lifeline where there is no trace of the object you desired. On an energetic level, a person obsessed with desire is like a wild boar trying to catch a blue bird. The boar wants the bird badly, licking its lips, snorting loudly, and rooting the ground in anticipation. Naturally, the bird flies away. If, on the other hand, the boar had simply wandered around somewhere nearby, as if indifferent, it would have had a good chance of grabbing the bird by the tail. There are three types of desire. The first is when a strong desire transforms into the determined intention to have something and do whatever is required to get it. Then the desire is fulfilled. The potential created by the desire is dispersed because the energy behind it is fueled into action. The second type of desire is inactive and tormenting and represents excess potential in its purest form. It lingers in the energy field. In a best case scenario, it wastes the energy of the suffering carrier and, in a worst case scenario, attracts all kinds of unrelated problems. The third kind of desire is the most insidious. This type of desire becomes dependent on the object of the desire. Attaching great significance to the desired object automatically creates a dependent relationship and strong excess potential, which, in turn, calls into effect equally powerful balanced forces. Usually, the person's thoughts run along the lines of, if I achieve this, my situation will improve dramatically. If I don't achieve this, my life will lose all meaning. If I do this, I'll prove to myself and everybody else what I'm worth. If I don't do this, I'm worth nothing. If I got this, it would be great. It will be terrible if I don't get this. And so on. Once you become dependent on the object of your desire, you are drawn into such a violent whirlpool that you will exhaust yourself in the struggle. Eventually, when you realize that your efforts have all led to nothing, you will let go of the desire. Balanced forces will have restored equilibrium, remaining completely indifferent to your suffering, and all because of a strong attachment to the fulfillment of a desire. This is what happens when a desire is placed on one dish of the scales and absolutely everything else is piled on the other. Only the first type of desire can be fulfilled because desire is transformed into pure intention, free of excess potential. It is a common view that there is no such thing as a free lunch, 
and everything has to be paid for. In truth, we pay only for the excess potential we create. In the alternative space, everything is free. Since we are already using these terms, it could be said that the absence of importance and dependent relationships are a kind of payment for the fulfillment of desire. The energy of pure intention is all that is required for you to transfer to a lifeline where the object of desire becomes a part of your reality. We will return later to the subject of intention. For now, we will simply note that pure intention is desire and action without the attribution of importance. For example, going to the shop to buy a newspaper is a pure intention because it is in no way inhibited. The greater an event is valued, the more likely it is to fall through in some way. If you attribute huge value to what you have, sooner or later, balanced forces will take it from you. If what you want to receive is hugely important to you, there is very little chance of you actually getting it unless you lower the stakes. For example, you are mad about your new car. You blow the dust off it, cherish it, fear it may be scratched, and generally worship it. The huge value you place on your car creates excess potential because, in the reality of the information field, its true meaning is close to nil. Balanced forces will soon find a clumsy driver to cripple your car, or you may bump it somewhere by being overly cautious. All you have to do is level out your attitude towards it, treat it as the relatively ordinary object that it is, and the chances of it being damaged will be sharply reduced. Treating your car as something ordinary does not mean carelessly. You can take perfectly good care of a car without idolizing it. There is another aspect to the dynamics of strong desire. A lot of people believe that if you want something badly enough, you will get it. This would suggest that strength of desire can bring you onto a lifeline where your desire will be fulfilled, but that is not the case. If your desire has become dependent, like a kind of psychosis, or you are hysterically driven to obtain something, whatever the cost, then somewhere deep down inside, you do not really believe that you can achieve it. This creates strong interference in the thought energy you are transmitting. If you do not truly have faith in something, you will try really hard to convince yourself that you can achieve what you want, thereby boosting the level of excess potential even more. With this kind of dynamic, there is a risk that your life work could actually take you all your life to achieve. All you can do is reduce the significance your aim has for you personally and set about achieving what you desire in the same manner as you would if you were to go to the shop to buy a newspaper. The strong desire to avoid something is a logical continuation of being dissatisfied either with yourself or with something in your environment. The greater the negative attachment, the more powerful the excess potential will be. The more you want to avoid something, the greater the probability that you will experience it because balanced forces have no attachment to the means of restoring balance. They simply have two alternatives which are either to draw you away from encountering the thing you want to avoid or to bring you into contact with it. It is better to consciously stop negating things in your environment so that you do not create excess potential in the first place. But this is not the only consequence of strong negative attachment. When you think about the thing you are negating, you radiate energy at the frequency of a lifeline where that thing is present. 
you always get the things you love to hate. In reality, this is what happens when you actively desire for something not to happen. Imagine a man attending a grand reception at an embassy. The atmosphere is formal, refined, and sedate. The man starts waving his hands about uncontrollably, stamping his feet, and screaming desperately how much he would hate to be forced to leave immediately. Naturally, the security guys would appear forthwith, grabbing the strange guest under the arms. The man whines and tries to resist, but is nonetheless swiftly escorted out of the building. This is, of course, an exaggerated picture of reality, but on an energetic level, the dynamic of negative attachment has the same level of force and intensity. Let us take another example. In the middle of the night, you are woken up by your noisy neighbors. You really want to sleep because you have to go to work in the morning, but it seems like your neighbor's party is just getting going. The more you want them to stop, the more likely the party is to go on for some time. The angrier you get, the noisier the party becomes, and if you start to hate your neighbors with intensity, you can guarantee that the late night parties will become more frequent. To solve the problem, you can apply the method of defeating or stopping the pendulum. You will stop the pendulum sway if you choose to see the situation as a parody. You could also ignore the situation, refusing to show any sign of interest or emotion. Then the pendulum will be defeated and no excess potential is created. Take comfort in the awareness that you have freedom of choice and that you know how to use it. Soon, the neighbors will settle down. This is how it works. Try it out for yourself. Now, you can think back and recognize what things in your life you have attributed excessive importance to and what problems you came up against as a result. If things are genuinely awful, let go of the idea of their importance totally. Shake loose your dependency on the situation and start transmitting positive energy right away. The worse things are now, the better, as this will enable you to assess how the technique works if you feel you have suffered great loss. Take heart. In this situation, balanced forces are on your side because their task is to compensate bad with good. Things can no more be bad all the time than they can be good all the time. No one can ride the wave of success all their lives. This is what it would look like on an energetic level if you were to reattune your energy in this way. Imagine you were attacked, abused, beaten up, and everything you had on you was taken, and then, all of a sudden, you were shoved a bag which turned out to be full of money. The more you were wounded, the greater the amount of money in the bag there would be. Guilt. Guilt is pure excess potential. In nature, there are no notions of good and bad. For balanced forces, both good and bad deeds are equivalent. The important thing in either case is to restore balance if excess potential arises. If you have behaved badly, become aware of it, and then started to feel guilty, I should be punished, you will have created potential. If you have acted well, become aware of it, and started feeling proud of yourself, I should be rewarded, then you will also have created potential. Balanced forces have no concept that some things should be rewarded and others punished. They simply eliminate inhomogeneity in the energy field. The payment for feelings of guilt will always be punishment in one form or another. If you do not feel guilty, then punishment might not be forthcoming. 
Unfortunately, feelings of pride that you experience when you have done something good will also lead to punishment rather than reward because the purpose of balanced forces is to eliminate the excess potential of pride, whereas a reward would only enhance it. An induced feeling of guilt, i.e. guilt you feel when proper people are expecting you to feel guilty, creates excess potential squared. As well as your own conscience bothering you, you also have to bear the anger of the righteous as well. Finally, the greatest excess potential is generated by people who experience unwarranted feelings of guilt caused by an innate tendency to always take the blame. In this case, there is absolutely no point in suffering pangs of conscience because the reason for the guilt was made up in the first place. Having a guilt complex can ruin your life because you will be constantly subject to the impact of balanced forces appearing in order to eliminate the bias of guilt for imagined crimes. There is a truth in the saying, impudence is second happiness. In general, people whose conscience does not bother them are not affected by balanced forces, even if they have committed a wrongdoing. It would be great if God automatically punished all the villains and culprits. Justice would prevail and evil be overcome. Nonetheless, there is no justice as such in nature and so, sad as it may be, the opposite happens. Decent people who have an inherent feeling of guilt are the ones who constantly face misfortune, whereas the shameless and the cynical often go through life not only unpunished but successful. Feelings of guilt will always produce a script that includes punishment, whether you are conscious of what is happening or not. Your subconscious follows the script and makes you pay. In a best case scenario, you will get away with a few cuts or bruises or some kind of problem will arise. In a worst case scenario, you could have an accident with serious repercussions. This is what a feeling of guilt does. It brings nothing useful or creative, only destruction. It is better to avoid doing anything that would later cause you to feel guilty than to torture yourself with a guilty conscience. Once you can say to yourself that you have not actually done anything wrong, it is totally futile to continue torturing yourself with a guilt complex. The feelings you suffer will not benefit anyone, least of all you. The Ten Commandments are not so much morals in the ethical sense as recommendations for how to maintain balance. It is we, with our basic childlike outlook, who have interpreted the commandments as if they were our mother warning us not to be naughty, otherwise she will make us stand in the corner. On the contrary, nothing is said about punishing people who get up to a little mischief. People create their own problems by destroying the balance. The commandments are simply a warning. As we said earlier, guilt is like a thread that pendulums and especially manipulators can use to control you. Manipulators are people who act according to the construct of, you have to do what I tell you to now because you are guilty, or I am better than you because you are in the wrong. A manipulator tries to impose a feeling of guilt onto their charges to gain power over them or for their own self-assertion. On the surface, these people can seem very proper. In their view, what is good and what is bad was established long ago. They always say the right thing and their actions are impeccably correct. However, in fairness, it should be said that not all people who are respectable and decent have a tendency to manipulate. The need to lecture and guide is a consequence of doubt and uncertainty that plagues a person's soul. 
they skillfully hide their inner struggle from themselves and those around them, lacking the inner strength that truly decent people possess. The manipulator seeks self-assertion at the expense of others. The need to lecture and control stems from the desire to strengthen their own position, which they do by belittling their adopted ward. Thus, dependent relationships are created. It would be wonderful if balanced forces could make sure that manipulators got what they deserve. However, Excess potential only arises where there is tension and a buildup of energy. In this case, there is no buildup of excess potential because the ward gives their energy to the manipulator, creating a flow. As a result, the manipulator stands uncorrected. As soon as a person indicates that they are willing to absorb guilt, a manipulator will stick to that person like glue and feed on their energy. This dynamic can be avoided simply by refusing to take on feelings of guilt. You do not have to justify yourself to anyone and you do not owe anybody anything. If you are to blame for something, then you can accept the punishment as long as you do not get stuck in the position of the guilty party afterwards. You do not owe those close to you anything either. After all, you care about them because you love them, not because you have been coerced into doing so. This is a completely different matter. If you have a tendency to justify yourself, start letting go of it. Once a manipulative individual realizes they no longer have a way of hooking into your energy, they will leave you alone. Guilt goes hand in hand with an inferiority complex. If you feel inferior in any way, it is because you have compared yourself to others. It is as if you create trials where you play the role of judge over yourself. In reality, it only feels as if you are the judge. The true dynamic works out slightly differently. If you have a natural predisposition to take blame upon yourself, irrespective of what the blame is about, it follows that you can also be found guilty and punished. By comparing yourself with others, you place them in a superior position of authority. In so doing, you are enabling others to suppose they are somehow better than you. The likelihood is that other people do not actually believe they are better than you. But if you have come to this conclusion yourself, you end up playing the role of judge in their name. By assuming the role of the guilty party, willingly giving yourself to the court, you are effectively inviting other people to judge you. Appropriate action is to stand up from the accused bench and reclaim the right to be yourself. No one will dare judge you if you do not consider yourself guilty. Only you can give others the privilege of being your judge. This might all seem like empty rhetoric because if someone has a real flaw, we all know that there will be always someone willing to point it out. This only happens though if they sense that you are predisposed to accepting the blame for your shortcomings. If you consider yourself guilty of being worse than others, even for a second, it will most certainly be used against you. The opposite is also true. If you are free of the feeling of guilt, it will never occur to anyone to assert themselves over you. Here, Excess potential has a very subtle influence on the surrounding energetic environment. These ideas are difficult to accept and the technique cannot be proven in words. Do not just take my word for it. Try it. Power and courage also represent aspects of the guilt dynamic. People who have a tendency to feel guilty only subject their will to a person who is immune to the same tendency. If a person is, in principle, willing to admit guilt for anything at all, 
subconsciously they are willing to endure punishment and subordinate themselves to others. If a person is not plagued by feelings of guilt, but has a need to assert themselves, then they can easily become a manipulator. I am not trying to say that the world is divided into manipulators and string puppets. I am just inviting you to observe a pattern. Rulers and leaders have a very poorly developed sense of guilt or do not experience feelings of guilt at all. Feeling guilty is a foreign concept to cynics and other types who have no conscience. Their way of progressing in life is to wade through the slaughter and walk over other people. It is not surprising that it is often the unscrupulous that come to power. This does not mean that power of itself is bad or that any person in a position of power is bad. Who can say? Perhaps your happiness also lies in becoming a pendulum's favorite. Every individual must decide for themselves how they wish to keep their conscience clear. No one else has the right to tell you what to do. One thing is clear. Indulging in feelings of guilt can only undermine your position. Boldness indicates the absence of guilt. Fear lies in the subconscious and is evoked not only by the unknown, but also by the dread of punishment. A person who is guilty theoretically agrees to bear punishment and therefore experiences fear. Brave people are never tormented by pangs of conscience and they suffer not the slightest feeling of guilt. They have nothing to fear because their inner judge has declared that they are in the right. Quite the opposite position is true of the timid victim who is uncertain of whether they are behaving correctly or not. The victim fears being declared guilty, giving everyone the right to administer punishment. Even the faintest, most deeply hidden feeling of guilt can open the gates to punishment in the subconscious mind. A person who feels guilty theoretically agrees that robbers and bandits have a right to attack them as a form of punishment, and so they are afraid. People have learned that asking for forgiveness dissolves the excess potential of guilt, and it really works. When a person carries feelings of guilt, they hold on to negative energy, which culminates as excess potential. In asking for forgiveness, a person lets go of the energy, allowing it to dissipate. Asking for forgiveness, admitting your mistakes, praying for forgiveness and confession are all ways of eliminating the excess potential of guilt. When a person allows themselves to be forgiven, they can let go of the accusation they originally created and then feel better for it. The only thing to be careful of is indulging in remorse. If a person goes too far in their remorseful attitude, they risk becoming dependent on manipulators who are just waiting for the next victim. When you ask for forgiveness, admit your mistake and release the potential. Manipulators will remind you of your mistake on more than one occasion, trying to reawaken your feelings of guilt. Do not react to the provocation. Everyone has the right to ask for forgiveness once and once only. Releasing feelings of guilt is the most effective way of surviving in an aggressive environment such as a prison, a gang, the army, or street. It is with good reason that the unspoken rule, trust no one, fear nothing, and ask for nothing, exists in the criminal world. The rule warns against creating excess potential. Guilt lies at the core of all potential that will serve you ill in an aggressive environment. In a world based on the principle of survival of the fittest, you can protect yourself by demonstrating your strength 
but this is sometimes too general an approach. It is much more effective to eliminate the idea of potential punishment from your subconscious. The following situation illustrates what I mean. In the former Soviet Union, political prisoners were intentionally jailed with common criminals as a way of breaking their spirit. What happened was that many political prisoners, by virtue of their remarkable qualities, not only avoided becoming victims of harassment and abuse, they became chosen authority figures among the harder criminals, demonstrating that personal independence and dignity are valued more highly than physical strength. Many people are strong physically, but strength of character is a rare trait. The key to personal dignity is the absence of guilt. True personal power rests on the ability to remain free of guilt and not on the ability to take someone by the throat. The famous Russian writer Anton Pavlovich Chekhov once said, drop by drop, I am squeezing the slave out of me. His phrase highlights his personal dedication to rid the conscience of any feeling of guilt. To get rid of something normally means to fight against it, but in the context of transurfing, there is no need to battle or force yourself to do something. In transurfing, it is considered more preferable to renounce, i.e. to choose. You do not have to squeeze the feeling of guilt out of yourself. It is enough to live by your own credo. No one has the right to judge you, and you have the right to be yourself. If you allow yourself to be you, the need for self-justification will fall away, and the fear of being punished will fade. Then, something truly remarkable will happen. No one will dare insult you. Moreover, wherever you happen to be, in prison, in the army, in a gang, at work, on the street, or in a bar, you will never again find yourself in a situation where somebody will threaten you with violence. Others may, from time to time, be subject to violence in one form or another. But because you have renounced the feeling of guilt and driven it from your subconscious, you will reside on lifelines where scripts of punishment simply don't exist. Money. It is almost impossible to avoid a dependent relationship on money because it is very hard to love money without wanting more of it. All one can do is attempt to limit the aspect of dependency to a minimum. Be happy if money has come to you, but never kill yourself worrying about not having enough money or spending it. Otherwise, you will have less and less of it. If a person does not earn much money, they probably make the mistake of complaining that they never have enough because the parameters of this type of thought energy correspond to lifelines in which there is no wealth. It is particularly dangerous to give in to an anxiety that your income is gradually decreasing. Fear represents the most energetically intense emotion a human being can experience. And so, when a person fears losing money or not earning enough money, they activate the most effective method there is for shifting to lifelines where they really do have less and less money. Freeing oneself from the money trap is difficult, but it can be done. First, the cause of excess potential has to be eliminated, which will either be strong dependency on money or a very intense desire to have money. Start by accepting and enjoying what you already have. Remember that things could always be worse. You do not have to stop wanting money entirely, but you can relax about the fact that it is not rolling in with the force of a gushing river. 
Take the position of a gambler who could, at any moment, just as easily hit the jackpot as lose everything. For pendulums, money is a universal means of rewarding their adherents. It is the activity of pendulums that has led to the widespread idealization of money. Money helps us to provide a good life for ourselves in the material world. Almost anything can be bought and sold. All pendulums use money as payment, and there is a hidden danger in this. Having taken the falsely glittering bait, it is easy to switch to a lifeline that lies far away from your true happiness. In pursuing their own interests, pendulums have created the myth that, in order to achieve your goals, you have to have money. As a result, people replace their original goal with the artificial substitute of money. Money can be gained from different pendulums, and so people shift their focus from the goal to money and come under the influence of a pendulum that is alien to them. People then lose a sense of what they really want from life and focus on the fruitless search for money. This state of affairs is very profitable for the pendulum, but not so profitable for the individual who becomes dependent and loses their way. No one will ever make a lot of money working for a pendulum that functions outside of the context of their true purpose because they just end up serving someone else's objective. A lot of people live in exactly this position. This is how the myth arose that wealth is the privilege of the minority. In actual fact, anyone can become rich if they serve their own goals. Money is not the goal, nor is it really even the means to reaching the goal. It is simply an accompanying attribute. The goal is what a person really wants in life, such as to have their own house and grow roses, travel the world and visit faraway places, catch trout in Alaska, go skiing in the Alps, raise horses on their own farm, enjoy life on their own oceanic island, become a movie star or an artist. It is true that certain goals can be achieved if you have a sack of money. So this is what the majority of people do. They go after that sack. By focusing on the money, they put the goal itself on the back burner. According to the principles of transurfing, this is like trying to get onto a lifeline where a sack of money awaits you, but you find it almost impossible to get there because you are working for someone else's pendulum. In the end, the person loses out both on the money and their own goal because their thought energy is focused on a substitute for their true purpose. We will return to this issue in the chapter, Goals and Doors. For now, we can draw one general conclusion, which is that if you have placed the likelihood of achieving your goal on the condition of getting rich first, drop the condition fast. Let us take an example. If your dream is to travel around the world, then, obviously, this requires a lot of money. To fulfill your dream, do not think about the money. Keep your thoughts on the original goal. The money will come to you because it is an accompanying attribute to the goal. It is really very simple. It sounds unlikely, I know, but this is really how things work. And soon, you will realize that for yourself. In pursuing their own end, pendulums have turned everything upside down. It is not that the goal is achieved with the help of money, but rather, the money that follows on as you create the path to your goal. Now, you can see just what a powerful influence pendulums have and how many seeds have been sown for myths and misunderstandings. Listening to these words, 
You may object that it is obvious that first a person becomes a large industrialist, or a banker, or a film star, and then they become a millionaire. It is true that those who become millionaires are those who think not of wealth, but of following their own goal. The majority of people think and do the opposite. They either serve someone else's goal, replacing their own with an artificial substitute, or renounce their own dream entirely because the condition of having to be rich first seems unachievable. In actual fact, there are no limitations to wealth. You can desire anything you want. If it is truly yours to have, you will receive it. If the goal has been imposed upon you by a pendulum, you will not get anywhere. We will talk about goals in more detail later. I am rushing ahead a little, but that is unavoidable because there is not anything else to be said about money. Money is nothing more than an accompanying attribute on the path to your goal. Do not worry about money, and it will come to you of its own accord. The most important thing now is to reduce the importance of capital to a minimum, so that you do not create excess potential. Think only of the thing you wish to achieve. At the same time, you should be attentive to money and treat it carefully. If you see a small coin on the street and are too lazy to pick it up, it suggests that you do not respect money at all. The money pendulum will hardly be well disposed towards you if you treat its attributes carelessly. Neither should you worry about spending money because this is a necessary part of fulfilling your mission. If you have made the decision to spend money on something, have no regrets. When you try to save up a handsome sum and spend as little as possible, you create strong excess potential because energy has been built up in one place. In this case, it is highly likely that you could lose everything. Money should be spent wisely to keep a flow going as potential appears where there is no flow of energy. Wealthy people support charities with good reason as it reduces the excess potential of their accumulated wealth. Perfection. Finally, we look at the most ambiguous and paradoxical way in which balance is compromised. Things that start small can turn out to have the severest of consequences. Usually, we are taught from childhood to do things carefully, to be thorough and always do our best. We are taught to be responsible and are instilled with a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Undoubtedly, this is how things should be. Otherwise, the next generation would turn into an entire army of slobs and slackers. The downside to this kind of upbringing is that, in some of the pendulum's adherents, the striving for perfection is so deeply instilled that it becomes a part of their persona. Some people become obsessed with perfection as a result of which their life becomes a constant battle. You can guess what they are battling with, of course. Balanced forces. The need to achieve perfection in everything creates complications on an energetic level because the assessments a perfectionist makes will inevitably be distorted. There is nothing wrong with always trying to do your best, but if you attribute perfection too much importance, balanced forces will come in and ruin everything. In addition, a kind of vicious circle is created, making the person even more immersed in their obsession. The person desires perfection, but they get the opposite. Then, they try desperately to right everything, but that just makes things worse. In the end, striving for perfection becomes a habit and can even develop into a mania. The idealist has a tendency not to place high demands on themselves, but to expect high standards of others too, which can poison the life of those they are close to. 
their high expectations manifest as an intolerance towards other people's habits and tastes, which often causes small conflicts that easily escalate into bigger ones. From the outside, it is easy to see how ridiculous it is to seek perfection in everything at the same time as tyrannizing everyone else around you. The perfectionist, however, is deeply involved in their role and seduced by the thought that they are impeccable, infallible, in short, perfect. They think that, because they strive to meet perfect standards, they must be a model for those standards. And yet, they will not admit this to themselves because, generally speaking, most perfectionists are too clever not to realize that enjoying a sense of one's own supremacy does not quite fit with generally accepted notions of perfection. Nonetheless, in a person with these traits, the feeling of being right about everything is deeply rooted in the subconscious. At this point, the perfectionist risks succumbing to the temptation of placing themselves in the position of supreme judge over the rest of humanity and deciding how and what all other lost souls should be doing. Naturally, the perfectionist easily gives in to the temptation because they are motivated by the righteous desire to set everybody on the right path and they have no difficulty in justifying their behavior because they know that they are always right. From then onwards, having wrapped themselves in the mantle of arbiter of fate, they assume the right to judge and condemn other people. In reality, of course, the trial does not go beyond everyday accusations and admonition. However, on an energetic level, powerful excess potential is created. The judge takes on the mission of deciding how the foolish ones should act and think, what they should value, what they should believe in, and what they should strive for. If some feeble being should suddenly decide that they have a right to their own opinion, they will be quickly put in their place. Anyone who dares show any resistance will be judged sentenced and labeled just to make it quite clear who is who. Of course, the listener is nothing like the idealist portrayed here. It is unlikely that a person who believed they were always right would be drawn to listen to this book. The perfectionist who feels they know how others should run their lives is free of self-doubt. However, if you meet someone like the perfectionist portrayed here, take a good look, because here you have an extreme example of how crudely the laws of balance can be disregarded. We are all guests in this world. We have the freedom to choose our own path, but no one has the right to judge others, to sentence them, or to label them, with the exception of criminal law. What starts as an innocent striving for perfection ends in claims to the privileges of master. Accordingly, the resistance exerted by balanced forces, which initially takes the form of minor problems, increases in intensity. If the idealist is protected by a pendulum, they will get away with their behavior for a while, but, eventually, the time will come when they will have to pay for their deeds. When a guest forgets that they are just a guest and makes claims to the role of master, they run the risk of being thrown out altogether. Importance. Finally, we will look at the idea of importance as this is the most common cause of excess potential. Importance arises when something is attributed excess meaning. Importance represents excess potential in pure form. In the process of eliminating importance, balanced forces create problems for the person that created it. Two forms of importance exist, inner and outer. Inner, or personal importance, represents an overestimation of your own virtues or shortcomings. The formula of inner importance 
goes along the lines of, I am an important person, or I do important work. When the arrow of perceived personal importance goes right off the scale, balanced forces get involved, and the hot shot gets a disappointing slap. They will discover that their work is either not needed at all, or that it is done badly. Puffing up your chest and sticking your nose in the air is only one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is excessive modesty and self-deprecation. The listener already knows what this leads to. The amount of excess potential is the same in both cases, the only difference being its positive or negative value. Outer importance is created when a person attributes huge meaning to an object or event taking place in the external world. In this case, the formula goes, such and such means an awful lot to me, or it is really important to me to do such and such. Consequently, excess potential is created and things go wrong. Whereas the feeling of inner importance can be controlled, it is much harder to do so with outer importance. Imagine that you have to walk along a plank lying on the ground. Nothing could be easier. Now, imagine that you are forced to walk along the same plank, which has been placed between the roofs of two high buildings. Walking the plank will have escalated in importance, and there will be nothing you can do to persuade yourself otherwise. The only way of eliminating outer importance is to have a safety net. The form the safety net takes will be subjective and depend on each situation. The most important thing is not to place everything on one side of the scales. There has to be some kind of counterbalance, protection, or alternative plan. Essentially, everything that can be said about importance has already been said above. There is nothing more to add. You may have made the connection already that, in fact, everything we have been talking about in this chapter is one variation or another on the theme of importance, inner and outer. All unbalanced feelings and reactions, such as indignation, dissatisfaction, irritation, restlessness, anxiety, despondence, embarrassment, despair, fear, remorse, attachment, admiration, exaggerated affection, idealization, worship, delight, disappointment, pride, conceit, contempt, disgust, resentment, etc. are all manifestations of importance in one form or another. Excess potential is only created when you attribute excess importance to an object or event that exists inside or outside of yourself. Projected importance creates excess potential, which calls forth the winds of balanced forces. These, in turn, lead to a mass of different problems and life becomes a battle for survival. Now, you can judge for yourself how much inner and outer importance complicates your life. But that is not all. Remember the puppet strings. Pendulums hook into your feelings and reactions. Fear, anxiety, hatred, love, worship, call of duty, guilt, etc. As you now know, all these states are as a consequence of projected importance. This is a description of what happens. Imagine an object is standing in front of you. On an energetic level, the object is neutral, neither good nor bad. You approach the object, wrap it in importance packaging, step aside to look at it and gasp. Now you have created an attachment to the object you are willing to give the pendulum, your energy. 
Importance is like the carrot that makes a little donkey obediently plod along behind. A pendulum uses the same carrot to lock onto the frequency of your energy, drain it, and then lead you wherever it wants you to go. To return to a condition of harmony with the rest of the world and free yourself from the burden of the pendulum, you have to be able to diminish importance. You have to be able to keep your inner guardian from dozing off so that it can observe the level of importance you place upon yourself and the world around you. By reducing the level of importance you place on things, you immediately re-establish a state of balance. The emptiness, absence of excess potential, gives pendulums nothing to hook onto and, consequently, no means of establishing control over you. You may protest that I appear to be suggesting that we all numb ourselves into being lifeless statues. I am in no way urging anyone to reject all emotion or even reduce the intensity of emotions they experience. Because, generally, it is futile to fight your emotions. Trying to keep yourself in check and struggling to stay calm on the outside while everything is bubbling over on the inside just creates more and more excess potential. Emotions stem from attitudes, so rather than fighting your emotions, it is more purposeful to change your attitude. Feelings and emotions are simply a consequence of your relationship or attitude to something, and that attitude is caused by one thing, importance. If, for example, someone in my family has had a baby, a relative has passed away, or there is a wedding or other family gathering plan. These things are neither important to me, nor am I indifferent to them. Do you see the difference? I do not make a problem out of the event, or torture myself and those around me with my emotional response. So, what of compassion, you may ask? I think I would be correct in saying, that compassion and helping those who truly need it never did anyone any harm. But it is still important, even with compassion, to observe how you attribute importance to it. I mentioned helping someone when they really need it, but sometimes people just want to suffer. They enjoy it, and evoking your compassion is just a way of indulging in self-validation at your expense. Or, for example, you see a cripple begging on the street and give them some money, but the cripple smirks at you as you move on, and it turns out that it is not a cripple at all, but a professional beggar. Importance does not exist in the animal and plant kingdoms like it does in human society, with the exception of pets that so closely identify themselves with humans and adopt aspects of human behavior. Society affects pets as well, it would seem. In the world of the wild, behavior is based on the fulfillment of purpose from the point of view of maintaining the laws of balance. Animal behavior is purely guided by instinct. Importance is a solely human invention that is enjoyed by pendulums. Any extreme bias of assessment towards outer importance makes a person a fanatic, whilst any extreme bias of assessment towards inner importance makes a person a despot. From the way I have portrayed reality, you may be under the impression that one can hardly take a step without fearing the consequences. Fortunately, things are not that bad. Balanced forces will only noticeably affect your life if you are very strongly attached to your own ideas of how things should be. You are obsessive or have just gone too far. The role of pendulums is also clear. We all come under their influence. The main thing is to be very aware of the mechanism for control. 
how they hook into you, and how far you will let them go. Reducing importance does not just significantly eliminate problems from your life. Once you have let go of inner and outer importance, you obtain the treasure called freedom of choice. But, I hear you say, according to the primary principle of transurfing, we automatically have freedom of choice. This is true, we do have the freedom of choice, but often we do not know how to use it because balanced forces and pendulums get in the way. By projecting importance, our entire lives are spent battling with the actions of balanced forces. There is simply not enough energy left over to make conscious choices or think about what we really want in life. Pendulums go out of their way to gain control and enforce their own ideas. What freedom can there be in this? All the importance we attribute to things, be it inner or outer, is simply a projection. No one is of any true importance in this world, and yet the riches of life are available to us. Children playing happily on the beach, splashing about, and having fun in the waves. Do not think about whether they are good or bad, whether the water is good or bad, or whether the other children are good or bad. Whilst the situation remains unchanged, they are simply happy and in harmony with nature. We all came into the world like that, as a child of nature. If a person maintains a state of harmony, the best that life has to offer will be available to them. But, as soon as a person begins to project importance, problems arise. People fail to see the causal link between their projections and the problems they experience. So, they buy into the idea that the world is a truly hostile place, where it is really hard to get what you want. In fact, the only obstacle on the path to fulfilling your desires is the projection of artificial importance. I may not have managed to convince you so far that this is the truth of things, but I have not run out of arguments yet. From Battle to Balance You may wonder if there is a way of counteracting the action of balanced forces. In fact, our day-to-day -day life is an ongoing battle with balanced forces. All the difficulties and problems we encounter are linked with the action of balanced forces. Trying to resist balanced forces is futile, as they will have their way no matter what. Any effort to avoid the consequences of their actions will only aggravate the situation. The only remedy for the impact of balanced forces is to reduce the excess potential of importance produced as a result of the underlying problem. The kind of situations life throws at us are so diverse, it would be impossible to give a universal recipe to cover all of them. There are, however, certain general recommendations that can be made to ease the way. People spend a lot of time building walls based on a foundation of importance, only to bang their heads against it or try crawling under it. Rather than trying to get over the obstacle, would not it be better to remove bricks from the foundation so that it crumbled? People tend to have a very clear view of the obstacles in their way, but a very dim view of the foundation the obstacles are constructed on. If you find yourself in a problematic situation, try and determine where you might have placed too much intensity, gone too far, or become obsessive, consequently projecting excess importance. Determine the meaning something has for you, and then let go of it. The wall will crumble, obstacles will disappear, and problems will be resolved of their own accord. Do not try to overcome obstacles. Reduce their level of importance. 
Reducing importance does not mean fighting your feelings or trying to suppress them. Excessive emotions and worries are the direct consequence of projected importance. It is the cause that has to be dealt with, and the cause is your relationship to whatever the event or other object happens to be. I could advise you to take a philosophical stance in life as far as this is possible, although this approach has already been milked for all it's worth. You have to make conscious the fact that projecting importance onto things will bring you nothing but trouble and, with that understanding, intentionally reduce the importance you attribute to things. Reducing outer importance has nothing to do with neglecting one's responsibilities or underestimating what is happening around you. On the contrary, neglect is the flip side of the coin where projected importance is concerned. There is a need to live simply, which includes maintaining a common sense attitude towards life. There is no place for carelessness or exaggeration. Rather than thinking so much about whether a person is good or bad, try to accept the limits of life. Neither does reducing inner importance have anything in common with becoming resigned or putting yourself down. Indulgently repenting one's sins and mistakes in life is the same as showing off one's virtues and accomplishments. The only difference lies in the value sign each type of behavior carries, be it positive or negative. Your remorse is only of any use to pendulums that want to establish control over you. Accept yourself the way you are. Allow yourself the luxury of being you. Neither exalt nor belittle your own virtues and flaws. Strive for a state of inner peace in which you understand that you are neither important nor totally insignificant. If your situation very strongly depends on the outcome of a certain event, try to find an alternative solution. In order to stay calm when walking along a plank, you have to have a safety net. In each individual case, the safety net will be something different. Simply ask yourself what might serve as a safety net in a given situation, and remember that it is useless battling against balanced forces. Neither should you try to suppress fear or excitement. You can only reduce the level of importance you have projected onto something, and this can only be done if you have a safety net of some kind, or a plan B. Never put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how safe the basket looks. The only thing that does not create excess potential is a sense of humor, the ability to laugh at yourself and others without causing offense. This alone is enough to stop you from becoming a kind of walking, talking mannequin. Humor deflates the intensity of importance. When trying to solve a problem, follow one golden rule. Before you even start considering where the solution might lie, first reduce the level of importance you associate with the problem. That way, balanced forces will not get in the way and the problem can be solved quickly and easily. In order to reduce importance, first remember and be aware that the problem or situation has arisen as a consequence of projected excessive importance. Until you can explain to yourself that every single problem is created by excessive importance, you will continue to bury yourself in its intensity as in a dream, remaining completely under the power of the pendulum. Stop, shake off the delusion, and recall what projected importance leads to. Then, intentionally change your attitude to the situation in question. It is not difficult to do. You already know that attributing excessive meaning to something will only get in your way. The main difficulty is to remember 
quickly enough that you are playing out projections of inner and outer importance. You need the help of your guardian, your inner witness, who constantly keeps track of all your inner values. A person's thoughts are gripped by the power of importance in the same way that muscles become tense. When something is bothering you, the muscles in your back go into spasm. You do not notice the tension in these areas until you feel the pain it causes. If you had remembered in time and paid attention to your muscles, you could have released the tension before it built up into spasm. Try to catch yourself when you start attributing excess importance to some event you are preparing for. If the event is genuinely important to you, try not to blow it up out of all proportion. The best recipe for success is spontaneity, improvisation, and a common sense attitude. Any preparation should be by way of creating a safety net, not by being intensely serious and over careful. This will only increase the level of importance you are attributing to the event. If you are worried about something and yet do nothing about it, this too magnifies the level of importance you give it. The excessive potential of importance dissipates with action. Do not think. Act. If you cannot act, then it is better not to think at all. Shift your attention to something else and, as far as possible, let go of the situation. The highest level of efficiency in any action is achieved when a person manages to shift the focus of their attention from self and the end goal to the process of performing the action. In this case, the person is not doing important work, nor is the work itself important. Excess potential is eliminated and balanced forces will not interfere. The action is completed dispassionately, but in no way carelessly or lightheartedly. You might be wondering why one should have to take the focus of attention off the end goal. After all, how can you do your work if you are not thinking about the end goal? Understanding of the meaning of this less obvious and curious fact will become clearer on listening to the next few chapters of this book. Why is it that sometimes you can get really anxious about a certain event? You think about it all the time, imagining all kinds of things that could go wrong, but in the end, everything goes smoothly and so much better than expected. Other times, the opposite happens. You are not particularly worried about a particular event, which turns out to have completely unforeseen complications and unpleasant sides to it. In the first case, the personal assessment of the situation is off the charts negative, whilst in the second case, it is through the roof positive. What actually happens in the end is a result of the impact of balanced forces which have the function of balancing the excess potential created by the individual. From this, one might assume that a student who intentionally pictures the worst possible scenarios immediately before an exam is more likely to get a high grade. It does not work that way, unfortunately, because any intention that originates in the mind and not the soul lacks sincerity. You can try deceiving yourself, but false sincerity has no energy behind it. Only an intention that comes from the soul has juice to it. This is why it does not work when you try to create a desired result simply via visualization, but this is a topic for later. Never, under any circumstances, should you boast about what you have, even if you deserve the things and receive them fairly, to say nothing of the things you have not yet achieved, because balanced forces will act against you. Make yourself at home 
but do not forget that you are visiting. If you are in balance with surrounding pendulums, swaying with them in unison, your life will be pleasurable and flow with ease. When you are vibrating in resonant harmony with the rest of the world, it energizes you and you achieve your goals without any particular effort. If you have driven yourself into a state where it is practically impossible to live in balance with the world around you, for example, your husband beats you, then you should think hard about how to take that crucial step to change your surroundings. If you feel that you have nowhere to go, this is an idea that has been instilled in you by a pendulum that is trying to keep you under its control. There is always a way out, sometimes more than one. Remember that a fly on the glass pane that did not spot the open window? Sudden movements that are badly thought out should be avoided. The best possible solution to any problem will come to you as soon as you reduce the level of importance you project onto it and free yourself from the influence of the destructive pendulum that prevents you from living in peace. You are already familiar with the two means of freeing yourself from a pendulum, defeat and stopping its sway. With that thought, I conclude this chapter on the complex and difficult theme of balance. Now that you understand how the mechanism of balanced forces works, you will easily be able to determine the reason for one failure or another. We conclude that it is essential to observe the principle of balance. It remains only to offer a word of caution against applying the principle too ardently, from becoming fixated with it or fanatic about it, as this will only negate the very principle itself. If you try and explain to a centipede in minute detail how it should walk, it will become so confused that it won't be able to move at all. In all things moderation, allow yourself from time to time to disturb the balance a little. Nothing awful will happen as long as you do not force the arrow off the scales. Summary Excess potential is only created when you attribute importance to your assessment. Only the importance you personally attribute to something imbues your assessment with energy. The force of the excess potential created increases if your assessment represents a distortion of reality. The impact of balanced forces is aimed at eliminating excess potential. The action of balanced forces is often the opposite of the original intention that created the potential. When renting yourself out, instruct your inner guardian to help you remain impeccable. Discontent and judgment will always turn balanced forces against you. It is essential that habits of negative response be substituted with the transmission of positive energy. Unconditional love is admiration without worship or the need to possess. Setting conditions and making comparisons leads to dependent relationships. Dependent relationships create excess potential. Idealization and overestimation always end in disillusionment. To experience reciprocal love, you must let go of the right to possess. You always have to pay for expressions of contempt and vanity. Let go of the need to assert your superiority. Striving to hide shortcomings creates the opposite effect. Your positive qualities compensate for any inadequacies. The greater the importance of your goal, the less likely you are to achieve it. Desires are realized 
when they are free of excess potential created by projected importance and dependency. Let go of feelings of guilt and the need to justify your actions. To let go of guilt, it is enough to give yourself permission to be yourself. No one has the right to judge you. You have the right to be yourself. Money comes of its own accord as an attribute on the path to your goal. Greet money with love and attentiveness and part with it without regret. Having let go of inner and outer importance, you acquire freedom of choice. The projection of importance is the only obstacle on the way to fulfilling your desires. Do not try to overcome obstacles. Reduce the amount of importance you project onto them. Take care without worrying.